So I am the School of Architecture and Planning's Professor of Planning. Um, I'm also heavily involved with the professional body, so I am a trustee of the Royal Town Planning Institute. We do a lot of stuff across um, across the region, I guess, and across across Kent. I sit in that capacity on the Kent Housing and Developers Group, so we have, as a school, a lot of tools and levers that we can pull and that we can actually begin to influence some of the stuff that's happened. So, for example, we were in Gravesend on Tuesday and we had 60-odd people in the council chamber from across the house building, planning, the development and local government to effectively share ideas. And that's something we do regularly. But I thought what I want... And the other thing I actually would say is that we're working with Greater North Kent um, and Epsfleet, the Development Corporation on Skills, particularly apprentices, getting people placements. We're looking at sixth form college students and, and that collaboration with industry is really, really big for us because we think it's going to have a tremendous impact here. One thing I heard on Tuesday, which I thought was very interesting and I didn't know that, that Dartford, uh, and that's what Dartford are saying, is the most diverse place in Kent. Uh, they won that crown from Gravesend, and Gravesend apparently is looking to recover that crown. That's what James Bird and the leader of the council said. Uh, and I think you're probably not that far behind. And actually that diversity, not only in population, but also in attitudes and perspectives, is really, really critical, particularly for placemaking and everything else we're talking about here. Um, and I thought I'll start with that. I'll, I have lots of pictures, and I can... Sylvia, I'll keep it short, but I can talk a lot or very little about the pictures. But the one thing we, we do in the, in, the, in the school, which is critical for all sorts of reasons without going into them, is look at the built environment in layers, or what we call systems. Because we think that's critical for service delivery, but it's also critical for the experiential um, experience that users of the space, i.e. everybody here, has on a day-to-day -day basis. And you see all of the layers in the slides, you know, so we talk about, you know, schools, green spaces, services, trains, transport, mm -hmm. pathways, hospitals, telecoms, you know, a big part, obviously, of, of you know, what happens in, in the urban space. I suspect uh, everybody here has had a close encounter with a 5G mast or otherwise, for example, coming to a place near you. Um, and thinking in the built environment in these layers is actually very good for our understanding of how the built environment works, and how the various bits interact. So when you put a bus gate or a bus lane or stop cars coming into a particular location, what does that do for everybody else or everything else that's using that space? And Canterbury has been really interesting to watch because they've now got bollards controlling access into the town centre and the Canterbury Business Improvement District manages that process. So it was an interesting thing how behaviours are slowly changing as people, particularly deliveries, get used to and try pushing trucks kind of through bollards. Even we had police cars in Canterbury City Centre getting stuck, stuck over the bollards because they come up very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, again, it's a learning experience for all. And placemaking is critical for town centres, especially for places like where we are, because I think it's primarily because of that. Because the way we use town centres is changing, and it has changed. So a lot of the spaces in the town centres we currently use and experience were probably built in the 60s and the 70s. But the way we use them today is very different from the way we use them in the 60s and the 70s. So we're no longer focused on retail. As you can see, you know, the big orange circle, it sort of dwindles as we, come into the, uh, as we come into the 2020s. And it's more about social, it's more about eating, it's drinking, it's the experience, it's the taking a look, it's meeting people, less so about retail. You know, so, and that's why we have big Debenhams that's empty. You know, we've got one in Canterbury, we've got one in, um, we've got one in Gravesend. Outside, you know, outside the train station, and you will have your own spaces here that probably were very busy and very active in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but are redundant. You know, they're, they're no longer useful in their current shape and form, and that's why I think that is is really, really important for our understanding of of high streets. 
the other word which is really big and it's it's probably misused is is the word resilience because you know we all want to talk about a resilient healthcare we all want to talk about a resilient education system we all want to talk about a resilient economy but actually an economically resilient town center is really important because it's and if you think of those systems and layers it's the things that make it work um, and this slide is borrowed from the association for town and city management because um, they do a lot of work on that and their chair is Lisa Carlson who is the Canterbury Business Improvement District um, Chief Executive and really, really active in that, in that space. But it's the relationship between the space, the placemaking and the economics which has to be inseparable if we are talking about the resilient town centre. And that's the layers. That's the economic system, that's the spatial system, that's the transport system, and that's the services system. So all of those are really, really important, particularly as we begin to change. You know, if we look at all of the lovely boards and drawings you have outside, for all of the changes that are being proposed to happen, we need to recognize the relationship between the various factors that may not immediately be very obvious to people as they look at them in the first place. There's a lot of text on that, but I think the, the one thing I wanted to, to highlight is the role of planning, is the role of neighborhood plans and forums, but the other one is that little kind of squares with the arrows um, on the right-hand side, because this tells you the various relationships that sometimes sit in tension with each other, and that's the people coming in, that's the in-commuters, in it's the people going out, the out-commuters, it's the high densities that you want to build and the high density activities that will generate footfall for you versus what you are, in a sense, in competition with. The stuff that sits outside of your city center, which is very much low density, but competing with footfall. You know, so all of that stuff is really critical. I think when you have somebody looking at a particular part of your city center, you really want to look at footfall. You really want to look at spend. You really want to look at things like dwell time, you know, how much people spend and how long are they <coughs> staying there for and are they spending more if they spend more time. And for you to want them to stay more and spend more, you want to give them the places that they can actually spend more time in. So that's where that relationship <coughs> between economy, spend and placemaking becomes very obvious and we're back to our systems thing because we cannot think of each one of those on, on their own. Ultimately, I think what underlies all of this is really, really good urban design. You know, what does it look like? What is the streetscape looking at? What are the materials like? What is the relationship between, if you like, a high street and, 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 and an old city centre, a heritage district? Who's involved? Who's shaping the argument? You know, we do have politicians here. We have. We have residents, but I think that last bullet point is critical. Involve politician, a wide range of people, and a wide range of stakeholders. Because those stakeholders will come from all of the systems. You know, you'll have the people who, for example, run the business improvement district. You will have the people who run the bus company. You know, because the last thing you want to do is close up a street without talking to the bus company, or the bus company changing the route without telling anyone. You know, because I think these, these things are fairly basic but actually they can have a really quick and detrimental impact on, on some of our high streets. Because I think you'd want some, really, something really nice like this. Anyone knows where this is? Has anyone seen this before? Yeah. yeah, so it's the, uh, uh, it's the, it's the market hall in, in Rotterdam. Uh, really built <coughs> five years ago, probably next to cube houses which kind of sit on their edges. But again, it, it's things that attract people to a particular area. They, they, there was, there's a bit of a political story behind it, which is the traders wanted to stay in the space, the city wanted to build housing, so ultimately the housing went on top of, uh, went on top of the market stalls, which is again a very clever design solution for a problem which otherwise would have been um, in, insolvable. But I think again, it's, it's street frontages, it's design, it's streets for people, it's this one you can't really see, but there's a high-speed bicycle lane. This is also in The Hague. There's a high-speed bicycle lane on the left-hand side of that street. Um, but again, it's, <laughs> it's a very, 
delicate relationship. But again, um, train stations, and you know, it's, this is again Rotterdam, but what could Chatham, for example, look like in terms of the access and the approach and the relationship, particularly as people come out of the train station? Is it obvious where they need to go? Is it clear? Is it signposted? Is it not? It's probably better than Graves End, by the way, and I'll tell you, because that happens. <laughs> You know, trying that on, on, on Tuesday wasn't, uh, yeah. Uh, but these are really, really important questions because they involve, again, the actors in the systems. Because you can't do any of this without network rail or the land that network rail owns and doesn't necessarily want to give up and doesn't want to talk to anyone about. You know, it, and it's not the urban designers who sort out the street space in front of this. You know, it, it is to an extent, but it's also the highway engineers at Medway Council. You so we can't do any of this without the highways team, for example. And that's where getting people to work collaboratively to produce really, really good spaces is really good. This one, it's, I, I put this because I think there's a story here. So this is Covent Garden from a few years back where it was covered up, uh, the whole interior with, with balloons. And it's, it's what constitutes art. And I don't know if anybody's seen the television series The Cleaner on the BBC. There was an episode about the statue. Did anyone see an episode? Okay. So Greg Davis, who's the, who's the cleaner, and he cleans blood from crime scenes. Um, he's called Wiki. And at some point, he's called out to a town because of a dispute over a statue between residents and the council. And residents threw fake blood at the statue when his job was to clean it. But it's a really... <laughs> It's interesting because it's real, you know, and it's um, um, when the council does something that people don't want and the people have a different interpretation of history or a different recollection of the, of the history from, from, if you like, the council. So that's a really interesting one. If you haven't watched that, watch it because that's exactly how it is um, in, in, in real life. Um, and these things, you know, they came through and under the active travel budgets during COVID, they changed. This is in Glasgow in Kelvin Way, where a whole street which was allocated for cars is now um, bicycles. This goes up to the University of Glasgow up the hill. But this is part of a broader resilience strategy which Glasgow City Council has been building for years. You know, these things do not necessarily happen over time. But this is where the pandemic provided an opportunity and the funding provided the solution in order to do this. Um, and it just created a different kind of place. And sometimes that's all you need. You need an opportunity, you need a challenge, but you need a strategy to also guide it. And sometimes you, you do your strategy and you leave it for a couple of years until you know, the opportunity and the funding comes in. You don't necessarily do everything in, in one go, but it's, it's having that phased approach to things so that you can actually do something, hold the space, hold the actual space and then come back to it and, and adapt it. And we've seen a lot of those, again, come and go. You know, some councils put them in, had to take them out, lost the funding on the back of it, got blacklisted by active public. <coughs> so there's a lot of politics that sits behind this. But actually, ultimately, it's about providing the spaces um, that give people something to do. I think Marilena talked about opportunities and how opportunities and change can be scary. You know, in, and this, you know, which would have been unimaginable in, in Soho before the pandemic, you know, if you tried to do it now without the pandemic, you can't, you know, because you can't, you know, s do that switch from cars to spaces for people entirely. It is scary. These opportunities are scary, and sometimes you need the decisions to make them happen, but you also, you need everybody to play really, really well together. You know, you need a whole lot of actors sitting in one space who do not normally sit in the one space. You need to bring them in the one space and say, find a solution. But these things don't necessarily happen all the time, and they don't happen, and they don't happen easily. But you know, us in the architecture and planning school, I mean, we believe, you know, probably rightly that this is what people want. This is what neighborhoods should look like. And I guess this is what you also want, want your neighborhoods to look like. You know, you want to use your local high streets, you don't want to travel a long distance, even though we want, you know, as people come, come into and out of Chatham train station, we want things to be nice as people travel. But we do want spaces to be inviting so that people actually come and use the spaces and when they come, they stay. 
Um, but this is where you begin to get into the debate about cars and parking charges and what's the cost per hour to stay and so on. But again, that's something for another day. The, the last two slides, and very quickly, because this is something that Creative Estuary has been working on. I know Catherine talked about Creative Estuary, and I think I, I pulled it from the website. To forge a future founded on creative energy and innovation along the length of the Thames, both sides in South Essex and North Kent. But one of the things we did, and we did that, and, and, and the team at Medway, uh, so Paul and the team in culture have been really, really strong supporters of this work, we developed a, a cultural planning toolkit, or we call it a, tool, a planning tool for culture. I, if you're a local government, or if you're a local planning authority, and you're doing your local plan, and you want to put in policies that would ensure that any development you do has culture at its heart, we've given you 14 policies that have been tested, that have gone through examination in a whole lot of places through a national piece of work, a lot of people were interviewed for this. And ultimately, the aim is you take those, you put them in your development plan, your developers, anything that you're doing, whether through your own land or working with a developer, it will give you the levers to make sure that spaces for culture are brought in into your development. And that would include, for example, outdoor spaces for, for um, any activities, outdoor theater, it could include you know, workspaces for creatives. It would in even include something substantial, what we call a co-located space, where everything comes in one place, where you have a faith space and a space for culture and a space for community, all in one place, so that you're maximizing um, the way you're, you're designing those places in the public. Critically, and that's why I put that, community engagement, co-design, co-creation, co-location is really what we're calling for here. You, know, you can co-locate a whole lot of stuff in one place, but without community engagement and co-creation, it's not going to work. You know, you really need all the ingredients. And there is, um, and, and I think you're going to see these slides later, and there is a link to the cultural planning toolkit. But if you're at Medway, Paul and the team have that, um, and Creative Kent have it, you know, so it's already out there, but if you haven't seen it, um, that's the link, and it will, and it will be on the slides. And I think that's me. Thank you.